this morning. We've been uh, talking about doctrines that divide us into different Christian denominations and the different beliefs that we hold as uh, believers in the Lord. And so today we're going to conclude that series with a message about Calvinism. Calvinism is a very popular uh, belief today. And so perhaps you've heard that uh, it's spread considerably. At one time, Calvinism was primarily connected to the Presbyterian Church. Uh, but there are others now that uh, are beginning to adopt Calvinist beliefs, different denominations, and even uh, non-denominational churches. There are some uh, Calvinist Baptists uh, that have been around for a long time. Primitive Baptists or Hardshell Baptists are known as Calvinist. They believe in their Calvinist uh, doctrine and beliefs. It's become very, very popular. I remember 30 years ago when I was in seminary, uh, I had a class on church history. In fact, it was Baptist history. And the professor told us 30 years ago, he said, one day, not too long from now, he said, Calvinism is going to be a big, big movement in our country. And so he was very, very right. He was like a prophet. And so that certainly has happened. A lot of young people are very interested in Calvinist doctrine. Um, it's been made popular by some very popular leaders. John, uh, John MacArthur is a Calvinist. Um, R.C. Sproul, some of you may be familiar with him. He's passed away now, but he was a Calvinist. And we have a, a Southern Baptist seminary whose president is Calvinist. Al Moeller at Southern Seminary is a Calvinist. And so I think he's had a big influence. He's been there about 25 years now, I believe. He's had a big influence over younger people. He began when he was in his 20s, I believe, or early 30s as the president. And so he's been there for 25 years and has had quite a, an influence and impact on a lot of younger people. So I've been very fascinated about this in recent years and wondered what's brought this about, this interest in Calvinism. Why is Calvinism kind of creeping into other denominations, including Southern Baptist, uh, the Southern Baptist denomination? Uh, why has that happened? And so, it, again, I think it's just uh, very interesting to a lot of younger people. It's uh, somewhat complex and complicated. Uh, it's kind of deep sometimes, and so maybe that attracts people. But uh, many, many folks have gotten involved in it, especially younger people. And so I want to talk about that this morning and why I disagree with Calvinist doctrine. And so we're going to go over that. And uh, this is going to be very simple. I'm a pretty simple person anyway. Um, but this is going to be very simple. It's not going to be a complex analysis of Calvinism. In fact, probably some Calvinists would listen to what I'm going to say this morning and say, well, he, he doesn't understand. You know, he's, he's too simple-minded to understand some of these things, and these are too deep, and he's not really getting deep enough. And so I understand that. And so this is intentionally going to be simple because, again, I'm a simple person, and I think it should be simple. And I'll do the best I can to explain to you what I believe Calvinism teaches and why I disagree with it. And so we're going to look at this uh, in a little more detail this morning. Um, first of all, in your outline, Calvinism is a theological system that was developed during the 16th century by the French reformer John Calvin. So that's where the name comes from. It is also sometimes called Reformed Theology. So you may have heard the term Reformed Theology. The Reformation began 500 years ago, 502 years ago, in 1517, with Martin Luther, when Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church and and wanted to bring about reform in the church. And so he protested many of the things that were being done by the Catholic Church, and that's how the Protestant Reformation came about. But there were other reformers, including John Calvin. He was one of the reformers. And so many times, uh, those that are Calvinists will refer to themselves as reformed, or I'm a part of the reformed movement. And so that's the same thing. It simply means they have Calvinist beliefs. And again, Presbyterianism is the primary example of Calvinism. I guess you would say John Calvin was sort of the founder of the Presbyterian uh, denomination, which became a denomination uh, that began with his leadership. But again, there are many different groups now that have begun to adopt Calvinist beliefs. Well, there are many different shades of Calvinism, but the five basic points can be expressed using an acronym, and the acronym is TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. You may have heard that. T-U-L-I-P. So we're going to look at each one of those uh, letters that begins uh, a word. 
that will help us have a better understanding of what Calvinism is all about. So, let's look at the five points of Calvinism. The first one, the T, stands for total depravity. The total depravity of people. Calvinists uh, believe that people are so sinful that they are unable to even make a decision about faith in Christ, a faith decision on their own. Uh, they really see faith as a gift from God, that God gives a person the, the gift of faith or withholds it from others. And so total depravity simply has to do with the sinfulness of man. Now, we know we're all sinful, right? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so certainly we are sinful. Uh, we are depraved because of our sin uh, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, our comparison with us and God certainly we're very depraved, we're sinful, God is totally without sin and so there's something to this, we are depraved, we are sinners the Apostle Paul said there's nothing good that resides within me and so we know that we're sinful individuals we have a sinful nature, we have an inclination to sin and so we are, we are sinful, there's no question about that, the question is are we so sinful that we are incapable of making a faith decision? That's the big question. Calvinists would say yes. They would say God has to give a person the gift of faith or they cannot be saved. And uh, they would say that that's something that's given by God and it's not something that you can do on your own. Now, the point to be made here is that we cannot do anything to earn our way into heaven, right? Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is a very, very popular verse. Um, that teaches us that we cannot do anything, you know, to merit salvation on our own. Uh, Paul said, it is, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And he goes on to say, this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so clearly we cannot do anything to save ourselves. It is all the work of the Lord, salvation. Uh, what we do is we believe, we trust and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and upon our faith, upon our belief in Christ, then the Lord, of course, adopts us into his spiritual family. We become a part of the body of Christ. And so Calvinists would say that faith is the gift, that God gives that faith to some and withholds it from others. I would say that salvation is the gift in that passage. For by grace are you saved through faith, it is the gift of God, and the gift, I believe, is the salvation that God gives to us. And so, see, there's kind, of a, there's kind of a struggle between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. Those two things have to come together somehow. And that's where Calvinists and non-Calvinists kind of butt heads a little bit. Uh, a Calvinist really, really emphasizes the sovereignty of God. God is totally sovereign, and he chooses who will be saved and who will not be saved. And non-Calvinists would say, well, yes, God is totally sovereign, but he also gives us freedom of choice. He gives us free will so that we can make a decision as to whether or not to trust in Christ or not. So it gets a little complex. Um, in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, the Bible says, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And so that word believe is a key word. In the Greek, it's pistos. It means to trust Trust in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And so trusting in someone or trusting in something is something that we have to do, right? We have to make a decision as to whether or not we're going to trust in Jesus as our personal Savior or not. And then in John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so certainly there has to be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. This is not just a decision that we just make on our own, we have the conviction of the Holy Spirit who convinces us that Jesus really is the Son of God, con convicts us of our sin, that we're sinners, that we need to be saved, and then urges us and encourages us to make a faith decision, to trust in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. I was saved when I was 11 years old, and I didn't know anything about all these theological debates and all that kind of stuff. I just knew that I was a sinner that Jesus was the Son of God and He died for me, that my sins might be forgiven. And as best I knew how, as an 11-year-old boy, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I trusted in Him as my personal Lord and Savior. And I prayed to Him and asked Him to come into my life and to save me from my sins. Most of you could give a very, very similar testimony. 
about when you were saved, when you became a believer in Christ. And so certainly the Lord is involved through His Holy Spirit in convicting us and encouraging us to come to faith in Christ, but we have to make a free will decision. The Lord doesn't force it on anybody, and so it's not forced will, it's free will. He gives us that opportunity, He gives us that privilege to make a decision as to whether or not to believe in Him or not. And so that's total depravity. Does that make sense? It's a little complicated, and I probably didn't do a very good job of explaining it. But uh, the key for me is that we make a faith decision. Now, the Lord enables us to do that, certainly. You know, it, it, we couldn't do anything without the Lord. But we make a decision as to whether or not to believe in the Lord or not. And I don't think that we're so depraved that we're incapable of doing that. See, a Calvinist would say, well, we're so depraved that we're not even capable of faith that the Lord has to give that gift to some people, and He chooses to withhold it from others. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. I think that the Lord gives us that freedom of choice to make that decision for ourselves. So that's the first point, total depravity. The U stands for unconditional election. And for me, this is kind of a primary doctrine of Calvinism, unconditional election. Election, of course, refers to, to those who are a part of the the body of Christ, those that have been saved, the elect. The Bible talks about the elect. And unconditional would mean that there are no conditions whatsoever. And so this is the belief that God chooses some to be saved and some to be lost without any conditions at all. And so that's a teaching in Calvinism. That God just says, okay, some will be saved, some will be lost, and there are no conditions whatsoever, even even us having personal faith. Now again, they would say that God gives that faith to some and withholds it from others. But again, that just doesn't make any sense to me. We have to make a decision and choose as to whether or not we will receive Christ as our Lord and Savior or not. Most of you probably heard the, the term predestination. Predestination is connected with uh, Calvinism. And some folks say, oh, I don't believe in that predestination stuff. Well, you should because it's in the Bible. The Bible teaches that we are predestined. In other words, it's determined beforehand what's going to happen, that we're going to be saved. Now, the thing is, the Bible teaches that we are predestined according to the foreknowledge of God. In Romans, we're taught that. In the book of Ephesians, we're taught that. And so God predestines us, but that's because way back before the foundation of the earth, the Lord knew that you would be saved someday. He knew that you would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would make that decision to trust in Him as your personal Savior, and so because of that, it, it, he adopted you into the family. He knew you, were, you belonged to him before you were ever even born. Isn't that amazing? That's predestination. And so Calvinists would disagree with that, and they would say, no, God chooses some to be saved and some to be lost. Let me kind of explain it this way. This is the way I understand it. So you've got a family of, say, six people. Can you imagine the Lord looking at this family of six people, mom, dad, and four kids, and saying, okay, these two can be saved, but these four are going to hell. No conditions whatsoever. That God just says so. These two are going to heaven. These four are going to hell. Regardless of any, there's nothing you could do about that. There are no conditions whatsoever. Does that sound right to you? It doesn't sound right to me at all. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should, what? Perish. And so the Lord doesn't want anybody to go to hell. That's in first, I'm sorry, Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so the Lord wants everybody to be saved. Jot down this reference, 1 Peter 2, 4. In 1 Peter 2, 4, the Bible says that God wants all men to be saved. So God's will is for everybody to be saved. So why isn't everybody saved if that's God's will? Because some choose to reject it. Some say, no, I don't want that. Some refuse to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if salvation was a gift that God gave to some and withheld from others, how could it make any sense at all that some would not be given that gift if God wants everybody to be saved? See, it doesn't make any sense, does it? It just doesn't make sense to me. And so God wants everybody to be saved, but He won't force you to be saved. He, he lets you make your own decision as to whether or not you will believe. So I don't think that we're so depraved that we're incapable of having faith. 
And I think the Lord chooses to let us choose. God is sovereign over everything, and He chooses to let us make a faith decision as to whether or not we'll believe in Jesus or not. And so I don't believe in, in unconditional election. In, in John 1.12, the Bible says, To all who received Him, referring to Jesus, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So the two key words in that passage of Scripture are receive and believe. And so when you believe in Jesus, when you trust in Jesus as your Savior, then you, you receive Him as your personal Savior, and you invite Him to come into your life and to save you from your sins. The Lord won't force Himself on anyone. He allows you to make that faith decision uh, as to whether or not you'll believe in Him or not. Uh, in Revelation and at Revelation 3.20, the Bible says, you know, Jesus said, I stand at the door and, and I knock. And he said, if any man will open the door, I will come in. I'll come in and fellowship with him or sup with him and he with me. And so the Lord knocks on the door of the hearts of, of people, all people, I believe. He wants everybody to be saved. And you have to open that door and let him in. Now, by opening that door, does that mean that you... You save yourself in any way? No. The Lord does all the saving, right? Uh, all, our, all our righteousness is like a pile of filthy rags. We could never do anything to earn our way into heaven. But the Lord loves us, and that's why He died for us. And so He, he wants to come into your life. He wants to be your Lord and Savior. He wants you to make that decision to trust in Him, and He allows you the free will to make that decision. And you have to do that. You have to open the door and invite him to come in. And so I, I just don't believe in unconditional election. I believe that uh, the Lord gives us the freedom to choose as to whether or not we'll believe in him or not. The, the third point there, the L, is for limited atonement. Limited atonement. Now this is kind of tricky because the word atonement sometimes is used in different ways. Literally, if you break that word down, it's at one month. At one month. And so, really, to me, that means has more to do with justification than it does the, the payment that Christ made on the cross. Oftentimes, when we use the word atonement, we're talking about the payment that Jesus made for us on the cross. Many of us use that word that way. Others, like Presbyterians, might use that word to describe justification, that we're at one with the Lord and we've been brought into his family. So it kind of depends on how you use the word. If you're talking about the payment that the Lord made, well, certainly the Lord made that payment for everyone on the earth. He didn't make it just for the elect. Calvinists believe that he died just for the elect and for no one else. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Um, in 1 Peter 2.6, Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all men. So he didn't die just for those who would believe in him. He gave himself as a ransom for all men. And so the Lord died for everybody. Even those who choose not to believe in him, he still died for them, didn't he? So that they would have the opportunity to be saved. Then in 1 John 2, 2, the Bible says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of who? The whole world. And so he gave himself, he offered himself as the price for sins for every single person on this earth. And so this doctrine of uh, limited atonement doesn't make sense to me unless you understand atonement to refer to justification. Not everybody's justified. The word justified means to be made righteous. And so you're made righteous when you come to faith in Christ and you get saved. But until that time, you know, you're, you're not saved, right? When you get saved... You're made righteous in the sight of the Lord. You're justified. So there's a big distinction between justification and, and the atonement, in my mind. And so you have, to, you have to understand how people are using that word. In that verse I just read in 1 John, it says, He is the atoning sacrifice. So He is the sacrifice, the sacrifice that brings about at one moment with the Lord, or justification of sins, you know, of your sins, of being justified before the Lord and forgiven of your sins. The Lord is the one who brings that about through his sacrifice. And so I don't think that the Lord died just for the elect. I think he died for everybody. 
but not everybody is saved. Now, that's the false doctrine of universalism. There are some that believe, well, Jesus died for everybody, so does that mean that everybody gets to go to heaven? He died for them. No, you have to make a decision. You have to trust in Him. And if you choose not to believe in Him, He will honor your decision, and He'll say, okay, gave my life for you so that you could be saved, but if you choose to reject that, then you choose to go off into eternity without salvation. That's a choice that you make. And so I think that's very clear in the Scriptures. The Bible says, Whosoever will shall be saved. Anybody can be saved. You know, someone asked me here recently, does that mean that if a murderer, a murderer who's in prison, who's done terrible things, if that murderer repented of his sins at the last moments of his life and sincerely trusted in Jesus as Savior, could that person be saved? Yes. Anybody can be saved. Now, the, the key word is, is he sincere? Is it real? Is it just a jailhouse confession kind of a thing, you know, or he found religion because he's in prison? Or is it sincere? Is it real? He genuinely is giving his heart to Christ. Anyone who genuinely gives their heart to Christ can be saved. Anybody. There's only one sin that will keep you out of heaven, and that's the sin of saying no to Jesus, rejecting Christ as your Savior. And so that's a free will decision that you have to make whether or not you are going to believe in Him and trust in Him as your personal Lord and Savior or not. And so that's uh, the doctrine of, of limited atonement. The I stands for irresistible, irresistible grace. Calvinists teach that the grace of God is so powerful that the influence of the Holy Spirit cannot be resisted. In other words, they believe that since it's a gift that's given to people, this gift of faith, that you cannot resist it if you're one of the elect. That you just, you don't have that option. You, you are not going to be able to resist the, the uh, Holy Spirit of the Lord. Well, there are numerous examples in the Bible of people that resisted the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. If someone is resisting the Holy Spirit, doesn't that mean that they're being convicted by the Holy Spirit? How do you resist something that's not happening in your life? How do you resist someone who is urging you to be saved? And so if someone is resisting the Holy Spirit, uh, that means that that person is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So Stephen, you know, that deacon, when he was uh, uh, being uh, stoned to death in Acts 7.51, he said, you stubborn people, talking to those who were stoning him, he said, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. He said, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? But your ancestors did, and so do you. And so he said, you guys are resisting the Holy Spirit. You're not, you're not believing in Jesus and trusting in Him as the Holy Spirit is convicting you to do. Isn't that a good example right there of someone, folks who resisted the Holy Spirit? We all know folks that have been under conviction, don't we? People that we know have been convicted to be saved, and yet they've said, no, I'm not going to do that. And so certainly it is possible for a person to resist the Holy Spirit. It's not irresistible. In the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the Lord Jesus told a story about a king who gave a, a banquet, a wedding banquet for his son. It's going to be a big wedding celebration and everything. And so he prepared everything and he invited all of his friends to come to the wedding celebration. And so the servants went out and invited folks to come and all of that and Everybody was too busy. You know, one said, well, I've got, I've got to go take care of my farm. I can't come. Someone else said, well, I've got a business to tend to. I, I can't come. And so all these folks that were invited said no. Okay? So you remember what Jesus said in the story? He said, okay. He said, I want you to go out, and I want you to invite everybody you can find. Go to the highways and the byways, everywhere you can go and invite everybody you see to come to this wedding banquet. Everybody's invited to come. And so the servants went out and did that. Then the place was full, and they had the wedding banquet, right? And then there's a verse of Scripture at the end of that story that Jesus tells us, and he said, Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but only a few are chosen. That's very interesting. So if someone is, is invited to come to something, that means the Lord, the Lord wants you to do this, right? And He's inviting you to come. Does it make any sense to you that the Lord would invite someone to come into heaven 
and then turn around and say, well, no, you can't come? That makes no sense at all. That's contradictory, isn't it? Would you invite someone to your party? Say, I'd like you to come to my party and send them an invitation. Oh, here, I'd like you to come. And then say, well, you know what? Never mind. You can't come after all. No. That wouldn't make any sense at all. The fact that you're invited means that they want you to come. You want them to be there. And so the Lord tells us, he said, many people are invited to come to heaven, but only a few are selected. You say, well, why is that? If God wants everybody to come, and he's invited everybody to come, how come only a small select group are allowed to come in? It has to be because that's the group that chose to come, correct? That's the only thing that makes any sense. Wouldn't it be unkind for the Lord to say, I want you to come to heaven, you're invited to come, but no, you're not one of the elect, you can't come in? Wouldn't that be incredibly cruel? Why would the Lord convict someone to be saved if they could not be saved? That makes no sense at all. To me, that right there just kind of blows Calvinism completely out of the water. You know, the Lord invites everyone, whosoever will, to be saved. He wants everybody to be saved. I think the Lord convicts everybody in one way or another to be saved, but He doesn't force it on anybody. You have to make the decision, you have to make the choice as to whether or not you'll, you'll come or not, whether you'll believe in Him or not, whether you'll trust in Him or not. And, and to me, that in no way violates the sovereignty of God. God is still sovereign. But I like to say God chooses to let us choose. He chooses to give us that free will opportunity as to whether or not we'll believe in Him or not, whether we'll reject Him or not as our personal Lord and Savior. And so I think that Calvinism is, is just incorrect. I, just, I don't think it's something that lines up with Scripture. It doesn't make any sense to me. The Lord gives us an opportunity, I believe everybody, an opportunity to be saved and gives you the free will choice as to whether you'll believe in that or not. You remember when you got saved? Most of you are Christians. You remember when that happened for you? You remember the conviction of God's Holy Spirit? Jesus said, no one can come to me unless my Father draws him, right? It's referring to the Holy Spirit drawing you into that relationship. And so certainly the Lord does that. He draws us into that relationship. But he gives you the free will choice. He doesn't force it on you. He lets you decide as to whether you will believe or not. Believe is trusting, trusting in the Lord. So it sounds kind of complex, but it's really pretty simple, isn't it? I think the Lord wants it to be simple, you know, for a reason. Now, are there occasions where the Lord kind of overrides our free will? I think there are. What about Pharaoh? Remember the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Some of the verses say Pharaoh hardened his own heart against the Israelites and against God when God said, let my people go. But there are a couple of verses there, if I remember correctly, where the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So sometimes to achieve a, a particular purpose, God might override our free will in a particular situation to bring about a specific purpose of some kind. Remember when Joseph uh, in the Old Testament was sold into slavery by his brothers? They were jealous of him and they hated him and they saw him coming and he's wearing that beautiful coat his daddy gave him, you know, Jacob, and he, they were jealous of him and said, let's get rid of him. Can you imagine that? Hating your, your own brother so much that you'd, you'd plot to kill him? And so they took him and they threw him into a pit and they, they backed off of killing him. They're trying to figure out what to do. And this caravan's going by that's headed for, uh, for Egypt. And so they said, well, let's just sell him to this caravan and uh, sell him into slavery, get rid of him. And so that's what they did. They chose to make that decision. And so he went off to Egypt. You remember the story. He, he spent some time in prison. He was falsely accused of rape and all that kind of stuff. And then he eventually became the what? The prime minister of the land of, of Egypt. And there was a terrible famine in the land. And so Jacob and his family were starving. And so the brothers go to get some grain because the Lord had led Joseph to store up all this grain for the coming famine. And so the brothers go and they, they didn't know it was Joseph. Remember at first he kind of played a trick on them. And then finally, he reveals his identity to his brothers. And he said, guys, he said, don't let this bother you. He said, I know that you meant to harm me. You meant it for harm. 
But he said, God meant it for good. So you see how God was working in that circumstance to bring about a desired result? And so which is it? Did the, did the men decide to do this on their own? Yes. Or did God lead them to do this? Yes. It's both. It's kind of a paradox, isn't it? Sometimes the Lord overrides at least some of our free will in order to achieve a specific purpose. Now, I think when it comes to salvation, he gives us free will. You decide whether you want to receive this or not, and I'll honor your decision. And I believe that very firmly. And I think that in no way violates the sovereignty of God. You think about how the scriptures were inspired, the Bible, the Word of God. Don't you agree with me that this is the inerrant Word of God? This is God's Word to us. And so how could, how could men, the 40 authors, 40 some odd authors that wrote the book of the Bible, all these books of the Bible, how could they have total free will and give us an inerrant Bible, the Word of God? And so God in some way must have overridden their free wills at least to some degree in order to give us exactly what he wanted us to have. And so this is the word of God. But he didn't use them like a dictation machine or something like that or a printer. He, he let them have their own personalities, their own grammar. You know, some of the books have very good grammar and others are really bad grammar and stuff like that. And uh, so it's just different. The personalities come through of the different writers of the different books of the Bible. And so the Lord chose to, to use that in order to, to give us his book. He used men to write it, but it is exactly, word for word, every single word exactly the way he wants it to be. And so there's a good example of how God sometimes kind of circumvents our free will to a degree to give us something or to bring about a desired result. But I think most of the time he just allows us to make free will decisions about things, um, like whether or not you're going to believe in him as your savior, or whether or not after you become a Christian, if you're going to repent and, and be a faithful follower of the Lord and, and be sacrificial in your relationship with him and your walk with him, he doesn't force that on anybody. He allows you to make that decision for yourself. So it's kind of a paradox. You know, a paradox is when you have two different viewpoints and they don't seem to jive, but somehow they do. When you think about the sovereignty of God, that salvation is all about Him, we can do nothing to save ourselves. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. But I also believe that God gives us freedom of will, freedom of choice, as to whether or not we'll choose to believe Him or not, and to receive Him. And so it's a paradox. Those two things go together. The only thing I can think of that might be similar is trying to explain the Trinity. Would somebody like to explain the Trinity to me? Everybody's got different viewpoints on that. You know, well, it's like when water freezes and then it melts and it becomes steam and all that. That doesn't really do it for me, you know. Um, I can't explain the Trinity. How can there be one God in three persons? How can there be one God, but he's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I can't explain that adequately, but I believe it with all my heart because the Bible teaches it. Jesus is God the Son. The Holy Spirit is God in the Spirit. And the Heavenly Father is God the Father. But He's not three gods, He's one God. And so there are some things that we just can't understand in our human minds, and we can't really explain it, but we believe it. And this is one of them, this, uh, this tension between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. They go together. They really do. I don't think they contradict one another. You know, one person who was kind of a well-known Calvinist was Charles Spurgeon. You ever heard the name Charles Spurgeon? He was a great, great Baptist preacher in England many years ago. And he had Calvinist beliefs. And um, someone asked him one time, how do you reconcile the sovereignty of God? God is sovereign. How can you reconcile the sovereignty of God and the free will of man? How can... How can God be sovereign but allow man to make a free will choice about salvation? And you know what he said? He said, you don't have to reconcile friends. They go together. We may not be able to adequately explain it, but they go together. God is sovereign. Everything is under his control. But at the same time, he chooses to allow us to make a choice about whether we'll believe in him or not. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? I've told this story before, I always think about it. Years and years ago, before I ever became a preacher, I was making some visits for the church, and I went by the home of someone, I think that 
I think we were just doing door to door visits. I don't think he'd ever been to the church. And it was a younger guy, younger man, and he had a little boy out there playing in the front yard on his tricycle. And so we began to talk to him and, and uh, about faith matters and all that. Do you believe in Jesus and all that? And he said, well, no. And he said, he said you know, I've heard this stuff in the Bible about how you know, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and, and God had this tree out there and, and God told them, you can have food or fruit from any tree you want except for that one tree. He said, is that right? And I said, yeah, that's, that's in the Bible. And he said, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. He said, that's like God teasing them. He said, it's almost like a parent putting a bowl of candy on a table and telling this kid, now you can't touch that, you can't have that. And I said, well, that's not the way I understand it. I said, God did this because he wanted Adam and Eve to make a decision for themselves. He could have created them like robots and, and forced them to love him, but he chose to allow them to make their own decision as to whether they would love him or not. If you could make your kids love you or just let them love you out of their own free will, what would you rather have? Wouldn't you rather have their own free will love? That's real love. They choose to do that. And I looked out at that little boy on the tricycle and I said, I said, if you could make him love you and make him obey you and program him like a robot, would you rather have that kind of love or would you rather have him love you because he just does it out of his own heart? He chooses to love you. He said, well, I guess that's a pretty good point. So he accepted that. I don't know that he ever got saved or not, but... At least he had a better understanding of, of free will. We have the free will choice. Isn't that an amazing thing? That the creator of the universe, God himself, allows us to make a choice about him. That's why so many Calvinists can't grasp it. They can't, oh, it can't be that way. You know, how could a sovereign God allow us to do that? Well, because God loves us and he chooses to allow us to make that decision for ourselves. So you see why I don't agree with Calvinism? Now, the last uh, point there is a P. The P is for perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints. Now, that's kind of a misnomer, that word perseverance, because it has to do with salvation, that the saints will persevere to the end. They'll never lose their salvation. Really, this is once saved, always saved. Boy, we Baptists can get on board with that one, can't we? So I guess we're all at least one point Calvinists, right? Or maybe Calvin was a one-point Baptist. How about that? I like to say it that way. Really, maybe a better word instead of perseverance, since we can't save ourselves and we can't do anything to keep ourselves saved, that's all the work of the Lord. Maybe preservation of the saints would be a better word. A lot of people get it wrong and say preservation. That's not correct, but it might make more sense. Once you've been genuinely saved, you cannot lose your salvation. And so that's what uh, perseverance of the saints is all about. The belief that genuine salvation cannot be lost. Now, we would all agree with that one. We would all say that's true. The Bible teaches. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Once saved, always saved. The eternal security of the believer. Once you've truly been born again, you're not ever going to be unborn spiritually. You're saved and you're going to go to heaven no matter what. The key question is, were you sincere? Was it real? Did you really truly get saved? If you did, you're a child of God and nothing's going to take that away from you. You can't do anything to forfeit your salvation once you've been saved. So, the Bible teaches both the sovereignty of God and the free will of people. Both of those things go together. It's somewhat of a paradox, but they do go together. And uh, we can praise God for that. Now, why is this such a big deal? I mean, who, who cares, right? If somebody wants to be a Calvinist, you know, does that really have any negative impact on the kingdom? I think it does. Now, they would disagree with this. If you thought that God just picked certain people to be saved it ran, it hit by his own free will choice and, and that there's no conditions whatsoever, and that would mean also that he picked the others to go to hell, correct? If you believe that, how aggressive would you be in going out and trying to win people to faith in Jesus? Would you really, really struggle, you know, to go out and share the gospel, and encourage people to be saved, if God's already made the decision and nothing can change it? 
if there's no way people can make a choice now, it's just you're going and you're not and that's it, why would we even bother to send out missionaries? Why would you do that? One thing I've never understood is why those preachers that are Calvinist are sometimes very evangelistic. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why would they do that? Witnessing is one of the most difficult things for many Christians to do. Am I right? We just have this uneasiness about it where we kind of are nervous about it many times. Most of us are. And so why would a Christian go out of their way to do that if they thought there's nothing that can be done to change the outcome? It's already been decided and God has already picked the ones that are going to be saved and picked the ones that are going to be lost and there's nothing that can be done about it. Why would we bother to witness? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Remember old D. James Kennedy? He's passed away. He used to be the great Presbyterian pastor in Florida. He wrote this, uh, this study on witnessing called Evangelism Explosion. You ever heard of that? Southern Baptist took that and changed the name of it by his permission and called it CWT. I took CWT years ago, Continuing Witnessing Training. And so a Presbyterian wrote this, this method and this plan for witnessing, how to go out and share your faith with other people. And I, I never understood that. Why would a Presbyterian come up with something like that? But they will say, well, the Bible tells us we're supposed to go out and tell people. And so we're, we're commanded to do that. But why would God command anybody to do that if he picked who was going to be saved and who was going to be lost and there were no conditions whatsoever? You didn't have free will choice. Again, that doesn't make any sense to me. And so I reject that. I don't believe in that. You know what, uh, you know what Judge Judy says? If it doesn't make sense, it can't be true, right? So, this doesn't make sense to me. So I admit it's a paradox, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, but they go together like red beans and cornbread, right? It's probably a bad analogy, but they do go together, don't they? And so I believe in free will. I believe the Lord says, whosoever will believe in Jesus can be saved. And that means you. I'm sure most of you are saved this morning, but there's some of you here that probably are not. You may have heard the gospel a million times. You may have been attending church for a long time, but maybe you have never, ever truly given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ by your own free will. Won't you do that this morning? You feel a bit of conviction right now? So, yeah, yeah. That's the Holy Spirit. See, God is knocking on that door. Jesus is knocking on that door. He says, you going to open it for me or not? He won't, he won't break the door down. He's not going to charge in. You've got to open the door. But if you go out these doors and leave and don't do it, that's a very, very dangerous thing to do. You don't know what's going to happen to you five minutes from now when you're out on the, on the road. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, why don't you come to know Him this morning? You say, well, you're going to make me come up here and talk to everybody? No, no. I'll pray with you right here at the front. I'll do all the talking for you. If you'll just come and say, I want to come as best I know how this morning. I know I'm a sinner I know Jesus is the Son of God. I know He died for my sins so that I could be saved. And I want to be saved right here now this morning. I want to know for sure I'm going to heaven for all eternity. That's all that's required. If you believe that, you believe it, why don't you receive Jesus this morning? All that remains is saying, Jesus, would you come into my heart? I want you. How about that? Let's all stand and pray.